I pray that you'd uh, continue to have your hand upon this ministry. And uh, Lord, I do pray as we try to preach here in this hour, God, that your hand would be evident. Lord, we've prayed, we've sought you. God, may the, may the fragrance of heaven be upon the service. May there be more than just a, a person up here sharing religious information. May there be a touch of heaven and a touch of God on this place. God, I pray as I try to preach that you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit of God. I pray you'd help my mind to think clearly and my mouth to speak clearly the wonderful truths from off the pages of God's Word. Lord, I'm just the messenger. And Lord, empower this messenger and touch me, God, and fill me with the Holy Spirit. God, I pray as I preach that there'd be no distractions. May the, may the seed of the Word of God fall on fertile ground. And God, I pray you'd help me as I preach. Uh, Lord, I pray as the old time preachers used to pray, Lord, that you'd empower me and loose me so I can preach uh, without fear of man. And Lord, I pray that you just do a great work in our hearts. And as we give an invitation in a little while, may the altars be filled with people wanting uh, to believe God and to know God and to walk with God, to trust you in a deeper and fuller way. And Lord, we we'll love you and we we'll thank you for all that you do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated today. I, um, we've been in the book of Acts every sermon this, uh, this uh, missions conference just about, and I think that's good, amen. And uh, I've enjoyed the book of Acts, and uh, I'm going to kind of keep the tradition here. But God has spoken to my heart long before we even got here about this passage of Scripture. And I want to give you just the outline real fast of, uh, of what's happening and kind of go through this with you. Basically, the Apostle Paul, a um, few chapters ago, he, uh, he believed that God was uh, allowing him to be put in prison and allowing him to go and, and witness to Caesar at Rome. And he believed that was the will of God for his life. And so he surrendered to that, and, and uh, he's in prison. And by the way, uh, this, these prosperity preachers are lying to people. Uh, they, they teach you that the word of God, that the will of God is, is just a bed of roses, and if you're in the will of God, you'll have lots of money, and you'll be driving a Bentley. You have lots of money in the bank account. Don't tell that to the Apostle Paul, my friend. Uh, the Apostle Paul's epistles were written from prisons, and they were, they were stinky places and dark, and he was probably sick and, and uh, had no money. And, uh, but I want to tell you something. These prosperity preachers are lying to folks, my dear friend. Uh, can I tell you, sometimes the will of God is ugly, and it doesn't look pretty, but it is the will of God. And I want to tell you something today. The Christian life is not some sort of resort. It's a battlefield. And it's a fight. I like it, but it's a, it's a fight worth fighting, thank God. And he's in the will of God in jail with, with fetters and chains, in the perfect will of God in jail in fetters and chains, not driving a big mansion. And I, don't, I guess Joel Osteen never read this passage of Scripture. I don't know if Paul's living his best life now here at this passage in his life. I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. But I see here that this boat is about to go under. There's over 260 people on board. They, they, they have lost all hope of even living through this situation. And uh, I see here something interesting in verse 21. I would call this the prayer of Paul. Let's go in verse number 20. The Bible says, When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. These men were living in a hopeless situation. They did not know what to do. Have you ever been there where you just thought, Man, there's no way out of this. This is that bad. If, you, if you're not there now, you might be there someday. Uh, can I tell you that uh, life is filled with ups and downs and dark days and bright days. But I find here in verse number 21, I would call this the prayer of Paul. Look what it says. During this time when everybody's given up hope and everybody's just uh, despairing about the situation, the Bible says, but after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. Uh, can I tell you today that Paul, during the times of hopelessness, he withdrew himself and he went and spent time with God. Amen. Uh, can I tell you today, that's what's missing in the church. Church people are way too busy today. I want to say, we live in the information age. We live in a, the day and age where, man, you've got opportunity to do all kinds of stuff. But I want to tell you today, I believe most people are way too busy to have a serious, strong, deep, meaningful prayer life today. I believe that, uh, that there are preachers that fall from immorality, but I believe the devil gets a lot more preachers with just being too busy to pray than he does with anything else. Uh, can I tell you, any time a Christian tries to get down to pray, uh, it's like you're, something happens, your mind wanders, and there's always something you got to do. But I want to tell you, if the devil can keep you off your knees, then the devil can ruin your life. Amen. I, I said this before and I'll say it again. I believe, I believe people fall in private long before they ever fall in public. I believe that. I believe that. 
Can I tell you, as a matter of fact, the, the, the first angel of the church, of uh, the book of Revelation, I believe it was uh, Epaphroditus, uh, the first angel, God told him, repent from whence thou art fallen. The problem is he was, wasn't fallen on the outside, he was fallen on the inside because he had left his first love. And can I tell you today that uh, the ministry keeps you busy. Uh, but I want to tell you, even in the midst of chaos and even in the midst of, of everything going on, the tempest is raging and everybody's losing hope and everybody's running across the ship. Paul withdrew himself and spent time with God. That's the prayer of Paul. But let me say number two real fast. I'll give you what I would call the proclamation of God. Look what it says in verse 22. And it says, Now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul. Thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Can I tell you that, that the Apostle Paul stepped back and he spent time with God and God told him and said, Paul, I've got a plan for you and this plan will be fulfilled no matter what the circumstances of your life are. Boy, that ought to encourage us today. I believe, uh, I believe what Mr. George Whitfield said when he said this. He said, we are immortal until our work on earth is done. Amen. I believe that. And can I tell you that uh, God is telling Paul that this storm would not prevent God's plan from being fulfilled in Paul's life. And uh, look at me, I'll give you the third point real fast. This is my, I'm a Baptist preacher, I give three points, a poem, an outline, and a tap dance, and an invitation. Amen. And we're on the third point right here. Hallelujah, it's a short sermon. Amen. The prayer of Paul, the proclamation of God, but let me see number three, the peace of Paul. Look what he says in verse number 25. He says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God. Now, this is a missions conference, and we're talking about reaching the world for Christ. But can I tell you, missions is a work of faith. It is a work that requires faith. I remember when I first sat down, uh, I was, I, we, me and my wife lived in Missouri at the time. And, um, and I was telling the people at a dinner table what we were planning and doing with our lives, how we were intending to go off and raise support. And, uh, and a person sitting across the table kind of looked at me and said, you know, Spencer, I, I, you're going to go and ask churches to send money to you monthly? I said, yes, that's what we're going to do. And she looked at me and she said, what are you going to do if they just forget to send the money? Which, by the way, that does happen. <laughs> you know? Um... I walked away from that table saying, I don't know. I don't know. What do you do? What do you do when churches just forget to send the money? What do you do when, when churches say they don't want to send the money anymore? What do you do when they see a Facebook post about a Hillsong video and they say they're independent, fundamental, primal, King James, only Bible, believe Baptist, and they get mad? What do you do? Yeah. Let me get Micah McCurry's phone number on the hotline. What do you do whenever you just, you knew this was the will of God, but you find yourself caught up in a hopeless situation and you think this is it? What do you do? You choose to say, I believe God. You choose to just say, I don't know, this doesn't look good, but God told me a while back that I was going to do this and this was God's will. And I don't know the circumstances, but I believe God. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, if you're a pirate on that ship or whatever the pirates were, I don't know if they were, you know, like peg leg pirates with birds on their shoulder and eye patches or whatever. But I believe if I was a lost man on that boat and this spirit-filled crazy lunatic standing up in front of me saying, Sir, nobody, listen, God told me that nobody's going to die and I believe God and he's smiling and the winds are raging and the whole boat's doing this. Everybody's screaming and hollering and he's just smiling and said, Don't worry, guys, I believe God. I'd have thought he's nuts. Psycho. Let's get this guy a psychiatrist, get him on some medicine because he's crazy. And that's how the carnal mind thinks. Sure. The carnal mind always looks at the outward things, but the, the spiritual man is able to see something that the carnal man cannot see. He is able to see something with a different lens from a different perspective. The thing is, is that God was looking down on that situation, and God was speaking to Paul and said, Paul, it looks bad, but don't worry, I've seen it ahead of the road, and let me tell you, it's going to work out, and everybody's going to be fine. 
And God told that to Paul, and Paul just simply said, I believe God. Can I tell you what faith is? A simple definition of faith is simply saying, I take God at His word and I believe Him. That's it. That's how you get saved. When someone shared with me Romans 10, 13, when I was 18 years old, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I knew that I was not a church kid. I knew that I was not a good kid. I knew that I was not even a moral kid. But the Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I took God in His Word, and I believed by faith that whosoever means me, and I took Christ as my Savior, and God changed everything from the inside out, and I became a new creature just because I chose to believe God. Amen. And then when I was... I was 18 years old. It was August of, uh, excuse me, November 2001. I got saved, and then I sat in the pew of a church. And it was 17 years ago this night, Easter Sunday night. I was sitting on the front pew of the Peachtree Road Baptist Church, and God, the Holy Ghost, spoke to me and said, "Spencer, I want you to be a preacher." And I said, "Spencer, who?" I said, Lord, don't you know what I've done? Don't you know where I've been? Don't you know there's some people out there that they, they're going to know my background. They're going to say, Spencer ain't preaching for me. Don't you know that, Lord, I'm not one of these squeaky clean church kids? But God said, I don't care. I want you to preach anyway. So I took God His word. I said, God, okay, I'll, I'll start preaching. And I got up, and I've been preaching ever since. And I've been, uh, I've been trying to just uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable is what I've been trying to do. And it's gone well, and it's, I've done okay, and I felt good about it. But I just chose to say, okay, God, I believe God. And I went to Bible college, and I was the only one in that Bible college dorm that wasn't homeschooled. I, I, I don't, I'm not a dirty joke teller, but I, I was in a dormitory of a college and I just happened to make the, the statement. Someone asked me, he said, what, what are your friends doing back home? And I just happened to make the statement in the Bible college dorm. I said, my friends are probably back home hanging out with their best friend, Jim Beam. Okay, I said that in the dorm. And one of those homeschool kids, seminary kids, looked at me and said, I've heard of Jim Beam. Where does he pastor? I said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't belong here. <laughs> Praise God. I said, he's, I said, him and Jack Daniels run the roads together. Amen. That's what I said. I thought, I'm in a bunch of retards around here or something. And I don't like these crowds. Lord, help us. But I went to Bible college because I believed God wanted me to be a preacher. And then when I, at some point during the course of Bible college, God pointed out a girl to me named Rebecca Sobey, and God said, that's the one for you. And I said, I believe God. <laughs> yes, Lord, I take your word on that. Amen. And I changed her name to Rebecca Smith. And then somewhere along the course of time, God spoke to me and said, Spencer, I want you to be a missionary to Kenya with International Baptist Outreach Missions. There's a man over the mountains of western North Carolina named Wendell Runyon. I want you to give him a call, and I want you to go on a mission trip with him to western Kenya. There's a ministry out there, and I want you to be a part of that, and I want you to take part of that. And I want you to start traveling, trying to help raise money to represent that ministry. And I said, okay. And I went to western North Carolina, sat down with an old man named Wendell Runyon that I had heard preach one time years ago. I didn't really know the guy but I heard him preach once and I thought he did okay and so I said alright let's go with him and uh, let's start going to Kenya and I went to Malaba Kenya in 2007. I actually went to Israel and Kenya on the same mission trip. I was gone home for uh, for 21 days. I was wore out. I was so sick of foreigners. I, I'll tell you what. I wanted to come home as quick as I could and I uh, got home and Waited, that was December. I waited till about April the next spring, and I called Wendell Runyon and I said, I believe this will be the will of God for my life, for me to join International Baptist Outreach Missions, be a field missionary to Kenya. And, uh, and they said, Okay, let's get you some cards printed up. Let's let you join the team. And you need to start calling churches. You need to start calling churches and asking them for meetings so that they can bring you in. You can tell them what God put on your heart and go through this process called deputation. I said, How do you get a hold of churches? He said, just call churches. Just that simple. I said, okay. So I found the phone number to an independent, fundamental, premillennial, King James only, by believing Baptist church in Powell, Tennessee, right down the road from where I lived. And I said, I don't know this pastor from Adam. I've never been over there. I don't even know anything about him. But I called him and I said, my name is Spencer Smith and God's called me to be a missionary. Uh, and I, I would like to come present the ministry to your church. And he started asking me questions. And just to make a long story short, the phone conversation didn't go very well. 
And the very first phone call I made on deputation, the pastor hung up the phone on me. And I said, I thought this would be different. I, I, thought, I thought you'd walk into a church and they'd just, oh, pray, here's $100 a month. I didn't know they'd make me work for it. I didn't know they'd ask me questions and, and like critique me and ask me doctrinal. They was asking me things about communion I'd never even heard about before. Are you open, close, and close? I, I don't know. I took church, ad, uh, church administration of polity, and I think they talked about it, but I was asleep in that class. I don't even know what I believe on that stuff. All I know is Kenya needs to get saved. Ask me, they, they send me questionnaires like encyclopedias. I mean, I, you, could, you could fill out a job application for NASA and get less questions than there is for these questionnaires for $50 a month. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Background check, driver's license check. What kind of investments do you have? What does that even mean? <laughs> what do you believe about elder rule? I don't even know what you're talking about, sir. All I know is I'm King James. I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. I'm against everybody. I hate Rick Warren. I hate Joel Osteen. I like to shout a little bit when I preach. I don't like contemporary music. And I don't like basically anybody. And I need your money. And whatever issue it is, just, just assume that I'm against it because I am. I'm against cat teeth, chrome on cars, argyle socks, toupees. I'm against the color purple. I'm against everything. Hallelujah. The only time I wear a bright blue coat is on Easter. And everybody says I look like an Easter egg, and I take that as a fat joke. It makes me uncomfortable. Every reference to fat in the Bible is positive. That's right. I've seen starvation in Africa, and it scares me to death. My greatest fear in life is to starve to death. And I don't want to do that. Hallelujah to God. Woo! It's a good message. Amen. So I start traveling the roads. And uh, started going to churches and preaching. Telling them what God had done in Kenya. And I found something out. That I had to get churches to take me on. But sometimes they would write checks to me and I would spend more money going to that church than they gave me on that check. And I thought, oh Lord, what do I do? I done spent $250, $300 to get here and they just wrote me a check for a hundred bucks. What am I doing with this thing? And, uh, and one year I got adventurous. I said, God, I'm going to take, I, I, I just, I just, I, I found a website that had phone numbers and I printed off probably 200 pages of, of just church phone numbers. I mean, in all 50 states. And I said, I'm going to call every church in America that I can stand to call. And I'm going to take a meeting wherever God opens up a door. And sure enough, God started opening up doors in weird places like Rhode Island. There's Yankees up there. I don't like that. God opened doors in South Dakota to me. It's cold up there. I don't even know how you live in a state like that. God opened up doors for me in Montana and Idaho and Washington and California. That was weird. Sacramento. That was strange. I got preached like I'm like I'd doing tonight. I was preaching out in Sacramento and scared that church to death. Amen. And, uh, and so I started preaching all over the place and I found out one time, I said, I, I started looking on my bank account on my cell phone, and I thought, this ain't looking real good. I said, Lord, I thought you told me to go on deputation. I thought you told me to raise my support. And I've been in this church and 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 this church and, this church and, and, and that church. I didn't like that church, but that church and that church and that church, and I don't care if I ever go back to that one and that one and that. And Lord, I said, they're not taking me on for support. It was a rough time for me. Matter of fact, the offerings that I was getting, they call them love offerings, but there probably wasn't a whole lot of love in those love offerings, my friend. <laughs> and we were in South Dakota in a, in a pastor's basement, okay? And I got discouraged because I pulled up my phone and I looked, and we had $4 in the bank account. We had, uh, someone had given me a, a $20 bill, one of those missionary handshakes, you know, $20 bill, had $4 in the bank account, and it was five days till my next meeting. And I got a wife and 
wife who's expecting our third child, and I got two other kids sitting in the, past, in the basement of that church. How am I supposed to feed them, take care of them? So I went, and I just, I, I was kind of like that woman with the meal of barrel with my son. I was going to take my $4, go to the gas station. I was going to buy me a large cup of coffee and a honey bun, and I was going to eat it, and I was going to die. That was my plan. Because if I'm going out, buddy, I'm going out with a honey bun in my mouth. It's going to be awesome. So I went in the gas station. I pumped $20. I paid for the $20 worth of gas because at least we needed gas. I went inside. Bought me one of the fat honey buns. Praise Jesus. Woo! It's a fat one. It was a $2 honey bun. And a dollar eighty-nine cup of coffee, and I was just praying, Jesus, oh God, I'm gonna swipe this debit card, just treat it like a gift card, whatever's on there, we'll see what happens, you know. And uh, it ended up being right at about fifteen cents short of what I had in my bank account, so I swiped the card, and uh, had my honey bun, you know, my coffee and my honey bun, and I walked out, and I kicked something in the gas station. There was a lot of sand there in the gas station. I kicked something at the gas station. Sure enough, there's two dollars laying there in the dirt and sand of that gas station. I said, thank you, Lord. Another honey bun. It's like another joke on me. I said, I'll get another honey bun tomorrow with this. Picked it up. It's hard. When you're eating honey buns on the road a lot, it's hard to pick that stuff up, you know. <laughs> it's, it's tough, but I put it in my pocket. I said, all right. So I cranked my car up, started drinking my coffee, eating my honey bun. And I thought, you know, I need to check what, was that, what that was. And I, I looked at it and I pulled it out. I said, all right, it was a $1 bill, and I, it was folded in half, and I unfolded it, and unfolded it again, and unfolded it again. And underneath that $1 bill, there was two, two $100 bills just sitting in the gas station gutter. <laughs> $201. That's a lot of honey buns, amen. I think we went to the Mexican restaurant that, that night, Amen. Had a fajita. That's my second favorite comfort food. Why? Every time I preach, I preach on food. I don't know why I do that. But God showed me, Spencer, I got you. I got you. I've got you. You're good. I got it. And I had to say, Lord, I'm sorry. You told me I'd make it. You told me it'd be okay, and I didn't believe you. And I'm sorry. That next year, I, um, I, I, I had to raise money. Are we okay on time? How are we doing? We got time. Can I tell another story? Okay, we're good. Yeah, go ahead. I, um, I'm entertained. I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 like I told you, I went and I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take meetings wherever God gives me meetings. And God opened up doors for me in the state of Maine. Oh, no. In Maine. That's where them Stephen King movies are all written at. Yeah. Maine. Everybody dies there. Yeah, I mean, it's like every sick, sadistic thing in the world happens in Maine. I said, all right, I'll go, I'll go through Rhode Island. And, uh, and my GPS, I was in upstate New York. My GPS would not take me to Maine unless it took me right down the heart of New York City. And I didn't know what to do. So I had to drive through the heart of New York City. That was purgatory in of itself. And drive up to Maine. And uh, we were trying to raise money for a conference. And this is what I told God, okay? I said, Lord, I said, this is what I'll do. I had to raise $5,000 for a trip in August so that we go preach and see people saved in Kenya. And I, I made this deal. I said, God, I'm going to trust you this summer. I'm going to travel wherever you open up doors. And every time a church gives me a cash love offering, I'll keep that for myself. And every time a church gives me a check, I'm going to give that to the conference. And I said, Lord, I'm just going to put it in your hand, whatever you want to do. Sure enough, every meeting I had for six weeks was a check. <laughs> I mean, every one. I'm not talking about like 80%. I'm talking about every single one of them. And I said, Lord, I'd, I, I told you I'd trust you. Whatever cash I got, I'd spend on us for our needs. And whatever checks I got, I'd give it to the conference. And I went to this pastor's house in Maine. And he had us in his basement. And Saturday night, he came down there and he started talking to us about his ministry. And after a few minutes, I, I, it was abundantly clear to me, Pastor, this guy wasn't in love with what we were doing. He didn't like nationals. He didn't like that. It was, it was, you know, I don't know what you call it, but it was, it was you never do anything for a national. You never help a national. 
It's all got to be the American, the American only, never help. And, and I just said, okay, whatever, it's fine. So I'm thinking, this guy, I drove all the way up here. This guy's not going to take me on for support. I'm broke, and they don't sell honey buns in Maine. <laughs> That's okay. So I got up, and the guy, the guy he was going to let me preach Sunday morning, but when he found out what I was doing, he said, well, you're just, we're going to let you have Sunday school. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to preach the Sunday morning service. I said, okay, it's fine. So I got up in Sunday school, and, and you pray for me, but I had what, what is known as a bad attitude. Y'all pray for me. You, you, does anybody, anybody ever get there, okay, no. where you're just frustrated, and like you've got so much stress on you, you I'm dead. I'm, I am numb. You can pile whatever else you want on me. I don't feel nothing anymore. Okay. Just whatever. Never happened for me. I bet. See, the, the Lord said when he put in the qualification for a pastor, he said, not a striker. The longer I'm in the ministry, the more I understand that. Amen. Yeah. And uh, so I got up in Sunday school, and you pray for me, but I got up and I preached against everything I could think of. I preached against Barack Obama. I preached against Rick Warren. I preached against Joel Osteen. I preached against Hillsong. I preached against everything that I can think of. I preached against Winnie the Pooh. I preached against Tigger. I preached against Piglet. I preached against Eeyore. I preached against everything I could think of. And I closed my Bible and walked out of the pulpit. And in between Sunday school and Sunday morning service, a man walked up to me, he had a cane. He, he was walking real slow, Brother Grimaldi. He's walking real slow. And he came up to me, and he's one of those guys, he, uh, he didn't believe in personal space. You know what I'm talking about? The ones that they, they get this close to your face and they talk. And by the way, why is it always the person in the church with the worst breath always that does that practice, okay? It, it's, it's, that, that phrase, it's, not, it, it's only uh, whatever, it, it only counts if it's close. That only works for, horse grenade, or for, for horseshoes, hand grenades, and halitosis is what it works for. Horse grenades, what horse is that? Grenades. I don't know. Listen to what I mean, not what I say, y'all. And, uh, and he got up in my face. He's an older, older guy walking with a cane. He got up right in my face. He goes, I saw what you did in Sunday school. I said, yeah. I like you. <laughs> And in today's society, that makes me nervous, okay? I don't, I don't understand how that works. He goes, I'm going to talk to you outside. And I thought, oh, Lord, John Wayne is going to pull me in the parking lot, and I don't know what he's going to say to me. I don't know nothing. He pulled me in the parking lot, and he reached in his pocket, and he said, I want to be a blessing to your ministry. And he put something in my hand felt like money. And he said, Young man, don't ever change what you're doing. I said, yes, sir. He said, goodbye. Walked away. <laughs> it was weird. People in Maine are weird. I said, okay. So we got up in that service, and it was one of those churches where it was like, it was, it was so dead like, if the Holy Ghost would show it up, they'd have to give them a visitor card. That's how dead this church was, okay? It was deader than 4 o'clock in the morning. Like, if I'd have pulled a 9 millimeter out of my side and shot bullet holes in the ceiling, they wouldn't have moved. I'm talking about, like, this thing was a funeral. This, I mean, it was bad. And I'm sitting there bored to death. And I thought, I wonder, what, what did he give me? And I reached into my pocket, and I, I, you know, missionaries have this sneaky temptation to want to check the love offering as soon as you get it. I reached in my pocket right there in the pew and I reached out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, eleven. Eleven one hundred dollar bills. I said, I believe God. And I ring up this story tonight to tell you that if God tells you to do it, it's going to be done. Even though it don't look good now, God's got a plan. Can I tell you, I, uh, I did a study the other day, Brother Grawley. I'm getting ready. I, I've got this YouTube following. It's really weird. I don't know how I got one, but i got a YouTube following. I've got 8,500 subscribers on my YouTube channel. I'm closing out 10,000. Really weird how that happened. But I'm getting ready to do a, 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 a video on why I reject Calvinism. 
Okay, I, I am not a Calvinist. I'm not an Arminian. I don't even think that paradigm even exists in the Bible. I think that's a false paradox, a paradigm. I don't even think it's real. But the thing is, the, the Calvinists go around throwing around the word sovereign. God is sovereign. God, sovereign. Sovereign. God is sovereign. And they act like they act like they're doing God a favor by calling him sovereign. We we believe that God is sovereign, and you people don't believe that God is sovereign. And I got to look in. What does that word sovereign even mean? And I found out that word sovereign is not even a Bible word. The Bible word that God uses in this Bible to describe himself is almighty. Okay, now here's the difference between an almighty God and a sovereign God. A sovereign God to do his will. A sovereign God for, 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 for a sovereign God to do his will in Todd Monaghan's life. A sovereign God has to grab him and force him to do it. That's why they believe in something called irresistible grace. They believe that a man, God has to force a man to be saved. The difference between a sovereign God and an almighty God, an almighty God can accomplish His will without Him. An almighty God don't need Him. An almighty God don't need me. An almighty God don't need you. An almighty God can do His will in my life without without. Without anybody else. An almighty God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And he's not bound by anybody's circumstances or anybody's opinion or anybody's anything. He'll do what he wants. And Paul said here, I believe God. I believe him. And so I just share with you some stories today because right now, I, I, in our ministry in central Kenya, we stand at a crossroads. We, we're either going to sink or swim. And I believe that God told me about five years ago, said, Spencer, I'm going to do a work in central Kenya there in the Nairobi area. And I want you to get in on it. I want you to go over there and I want you to start working with Francis. I want you to start working with Edwin. And right now, I'm at a point now where I, Edwin, the Momuto Outreach Baptist Church, they're selling the land out from underneath him. He's got to move. And it's going to cost $5,300 to move him. And I don't got no money. And then it's going to cost about $15,000 to buy him a plot of land. Guess what? I ain't got no money. And I feel almost in a sense like I'm Paul on the ship. And it looks terrible for where I sit. But God told me he's going to do something. And I just come to the conclusion where I believe God. And I don't know what you're facing, and I don't know if it's health or if it's circumstantial or whatever. But God's going to do His will. God can do His will. And the question is, do you believe Him? Right. See, his, his will is going to be done, and I believe that I'm going to just choose to believe God anyway and quit looking at the circumstances and say with Paul, I believe God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I love you. Bless now the message. Please speak to hearts. Help us, Lord, to believe you for all things. Help us to have that peace that passes all understanding so that we can just know that you're going to do the will of God no matter what the circumstances are. Bless now this service. We pray in Jesus' name. Preach.